So let me uh, begin again. Thank you for coming. This is the part one of two-part lecture series on uh, overview of the history of medicine. The learning objectives are to understand the contributions of Osler to medicine, be familiar with the role of the Greek physicians to modern medicine, to compare and contrast the importance of Galen, Galen, Vesalius, and Harvey to modern medicine, and to be familiar with the role of technology in the evolution of the physician patient relationship. I wanted to introduce you all to uh, William Osler, who was born in Canada in 1849 and died in Oxford, England in 1919. He was raised in a large family in uh, Canada and trained in medicine at the University of Toronto and McGill. He obtained his uh, medical degree from McGill in 1872 but did postgraduate training in England and Europe be and began teaching medicine at uh, McGill, especially pathology. Over his lifetime, he published over a thousand medical publications and in addition had over 180 literary essays which have come down over time as being as equal in uh, interest and importance as his uh, medical publications. In 1889, he became the first professor of medicine at the newly uh, instituted Johns Hopkins Medical School and Hospital. He was an expert in the diagnosis of diseases of the heart, the lungs, and the blood, and wrote in 1892 a very famous single author textbook called The Principles and Practice of Medicine, which became the authoritative source for many people around the world over the next 30 years. If you want to read more about William Oster, there are a number of classic biographies. This is the latest one by Michael Bliss called William Oster, A Life in Medicine. He helped formulate the Johns Hopkins Hospital and the medical school in the late 1880s. The four famous physicians who made up uh, this John Singer Sargent portrait were uh, William Welsh, Osler, Kelly, and standing behind was Halstead. And these were the individuals in charge of pathology, medicine, obstetrics, and surgery at the opening of the medical school. Quite a cast of uh, luminaries over the next 30 years. Oster helped create the system of postgraduate training of physicians that we know to this day. He emphasized the need for medical students to spend time with patients and uh, felt that one of his leading accomplishments was bringing the medical students to the bedside. He published extensively and built an international reputation as an astute and humane clinician and made contributions to the knowledge in a wide spectrum of clinical fields. He stimulated students who later became leaders of the medical profession, uh, both at Hopkins and around the country. In 1905, he was asked to become the Regis Chair of Medicine uh, in England, which he took up and held until the time of his death in 1919. In 1913, he was asked to give a series of lectures from what's the called the Silliman Lectures, which was based on a legacy that was left at Yale College to sponsor a yearly set of lectures uh, that dealt with the domains of natural science and history. Uh, the book ended up being published of these lectures, which were six in, in, in all. They were published in 1921 posthumously. And it's an interesting story that he <clears throat> was asked after 1913 when the lectures were given to come up with this book, which they were willing to publish. And he really didn't want to do it. He never got around to doing it. And in fact, at the time of his death, he told his wife, uh, Lady Osler, that he did not want this published posthumously. And she went against it uh, and, in fact, uh, helped uh, Fielding Garrison, who was a famous uh, history of medicine individual in his own right, who helped tie it all together. And it ended up being published against his will in 1921. It's the background of this evolution of modern medicine series of lectures that I'm going to be basing these two talks on. This is the contents of the actual book, which is called The Evolution of Modern Medicine. Uh, and there, as you see, six chapters. In today's lecture, we're going to go over the first four chapters. And next week, we're going to end up uh, finishing up with chapters five and six. Now, we could have gone a different route in terms of how you do an overview of the history of medicine. There are many textbooks of medical history. Some of them focus on disease and history, how diseases have affected the history of individuals. 
Some have focused on specific time periods and locations, whether it's the Greek world or ancient medicine. Others have focused on social factors in health and disease. And uh, these all take a different point of view as to how to write the history of medicine. And some focus on a timeline and a review of individual people. And in fact, that's pretty much the way Osler put together his history of medicine, much more of a progression over time, singling out individuals more than uh, complete uh, discussions of diseases to talk about the history of medicine. Dr. Agnoyan uh, uh, graciously gave me this table, which I like very much, which is not in the, the book, but it outlines pretty much the kinds of distributions that Osler is going to follow from early antiquity all the way to the beginning of the 20th century, going from discussion of folk and priestly medicine all the way up through the bedside involving laboratory and experimental methods as they were developed. And Osler really follows a very similar kind of distribution of his discussions. I also want to read some of and, and report some of the actual words that Osler uses to describe it to give you a feel for how he wrote. This is in from the introduction, chapter one of his book. Civilization is but a filmy fringe on the history of man. The ancient history of man, only now beginning to be studied, derives from the Pliocene or Miocene period. The modern history as we know it embraces that brief space of time that was elapsed since the earliest Egyptian and Babylonian records were made. To primitive man, life seemed full of sacred presences connected with objects in nature. Out of the spiritual protoplasm of magic have evolved philosopher and physician as well as priest. Knowledge, reason, self-consciousness, will are the attributes of men. And then he goes on to say, the purpose of this course of lectures is to sketch the main features of the growth of these two dominant ideas, to show how they have influenced man at the different periods of his evolution, how the lamp of reason so early lighted in his soul, burning now bright, now dim, has never, even in its darkest period, been wholly extinguished, but retrimmed and refurbished by his indomitable energies, now shines more and more towards perfect day. I propose to take an airplane flight through the centuries, touching only the tall peaks from which may be had a panoramic view of the epochs through which we have passed. Well, if Osler took us on an airplane view, this is going to be a jet fighter uh, going through the history in, in uh, less than two hours. Medicine arose out of the primal sympathy of man with man out of the desire to help those in sorrow, need, and sickness. He talks about Neolithic skulls with discs of bone removed have been found in nearly all parts of the world. This is in his discussion on the origin of medicine. Many of the figures I'm showing you actually are the figures that he used in his textbook uh, to make his point. Early surgery had been shown to involve trephining, in ancient Peru and other places around the world. It was performed for such things as seizures, headache, and trauma. So he says that, in fact, early surgery employed these kinds of techniques. But then he moves to medicine in ancient Egypt, in which he says, out of the ocean of oblivion, man emerged in history in a highly civilized state on the banks of the Nile some 60 centuries ago. And the first important person who sort of marriages the priest and the physicians is in Hoptep, who thought that diseases were due to hostile spirits. He describes using medicinal treatments and became over his lifetime and afterwards a god of medicine. Medicine at that time was not dissociated from religion. They were one and the same. A series of papers called papyri have been described and discussed and, and found over the period of centuries, one of which is called the Ebers Papyrus. And this was found in the 1850s in Thebes uh, in an excavation site by George Ebers. And it proposes to show a papyri that goes dated back to 1500 BC, in which as they went through this, felt that it was a pharmacopoeia which was highly developed. Surgery was not so highly developed. There was a discussion of the importance of hygiene and the importance of the use of secretions in parts of the animal body 
as medicine uh, throughout uh, the practice of Egyptian uh, physicians and priests. If you go and look at mummies and look at different uh, aspects of uh, individuals who passed away many millennia ago, it turns out that osteoarthritis was very common and very commonly found, especially among young uh, bodies, and it involved the spine. In addition, they've gone back and found arterial sclerosis with calcifications being very common in the mummies uh, among Egyptian individuals where they pulled it out. If you move to Assyrian and Babylonian medicine, here again, diseases were thought to be due to evil spirits or demons. Different incantations for different diseases were used. The art of divination was important, meaning they thought that there was influence of heavenly bodies upon man's welfare. Astrology followed astronomy and was very important. At the same time, they would do sacrificial animals and look at the liver of those animals as a predictor of what kind of diseases were going to accrue to that individual. And then the other important aspect of Assyrian and Babylonian medicine was what's come down to be known as the Hammurabi Code, which dates to about 2000 BC and outlines medical practice in, in some detail, and it was, appeared to be highly regulated. Scales of fees were, later, were laid down, penalties were exacted for uh, malpractice, and operations were performed. Let me read to you a couple of uh, the specifics that were translated from the Hammurabi Code. If a doctor has treated a gentleman for a severe wound with a bronze lancet and has cured the man, or has opened an abscess of the eye for a gentleman with the bronze lancet and has cured the eye of the gentleman, he shall take 10 shekels of silver. If the doctor has treated a gentleman for a severe wound with a lancet of bronze and has caused the gentleman to die or has opened an abscess of the eye for a gentleman and has caused the loss of the gentleman's eye, one shall cut off his hands. If a doctor has treated the severe wound of a slave of a poor man with a bronze lancet, and has caused his death, he shall render slave for slave. If a doctor has cured the shattered limb of a gentleman, or has cured the diseased bowel, the patient shall give five shekels of silver to the doctor. Okay, so uh, fee-for-service medicine was alive in a well, 2000 BC. If you turn to Hebrew medicine and just look in the Old Testament, you'll find many important discussions of hygiene and its importance. Big discussion of food prohibitions is in the Old Testament. There's discussion of how you can prophylax and suppress epidemics. Divination was not widely practiced. And in the New Testament, there's very little about uh, divination as well. And he goes on to talk about uh, what the New Testament was trying to talk about in terms of the body. He who went about doing good was a physician of the body as well as of the soul, and could the rich promises of the gospel have been fulfilled, there would have been no need of a new dispensation of science. It may be because the children of this world have never been able to accept its hard sayings, the insistence upon poverty, upon humility, upon peace, that Christianity has lost touch no less with the practice than with the principles of its founder. Yet, all through the centuries, the church has never wholly abandoned the claim to apostolic healing, nor is there any reason why she should. He then talks about Chinese and Japanese medicine, discusses the importance of Wuism, which is basically a group of what it turns out to be physicians at the time who had a certain body of knowledge, but they were really soothsayers and exorcists. They believed in universal animism, uh, that, in fact, uh, there were different good things and bad things dwelling. S uh, sacred uh, and charms were very important. There was the yin and the yang, the yang and the yin of uh, the light and the dark. That was very important. But in terms of medicine, they really uh, made major contributions and studied the importance of pulses and how they could predict disease. And they also did some of the first inoculations against smallpox, mainly through the technique of variolation that has come down. When Osler talks about the importance of Chinese and Japanese medicine, what he also mentions is the fact that if you really look at where they were in the development of this, as well as with the development of acupuncture, which goes back many millennia, 
you realize that they had a very advanced set of skill sets, but there really was no development for over a thousand years in Chinese medicine the way we think of some of the other things that we're going to talk about. And they sort of just stopped in terms of future developments. People have wondered why that was, but China sort of reached its pinnacle uh, in terms of um, medicine and its ad it advances over a thousand years, two thousand years ago. So one of the things I've learned from reviewing this is I also got interested is what did Oster leave out? What did he leave out that I would have thought might be important to put in in terms of a history of medicine? And one of the things he totally leaves out is any discussion of uh, uh, medicine as it was practiced in India. Indian medicine goes back m uh, many years. There are many texts. Ayurvedic medicine, which goes back to 400 BC, have different Sharaka and Shushruta, Samhita, which are different uh, compendium of knowledge. These were well described treatments based on restoring the balance of the essences, of which there were three air, phlegm, and bile. And the body was composed of seven constituents blood, bone, chyle, fat, flesh, marrow, and semen. They had a great and sophisticated herbal medicine, and they also had many skilled physicians and surgeons who employed steel instruments. They did some of the first uh, plastic surgery, transplants of of noses and things of that going back millennia, well advanced beyond uh, what had been described elsewhere. He never mentions this, it's unclear why, but Indian medicine is obviously something that is of importance historically. Let's turn to chapter two, where he talks about Greek medicine. And here I quote again from the book, let us come out of the murky night of the east, heavy with phantoms, into the bright daylight of the west, into the company of men whose thoughts made our thoughts and whose ways made our ways, the men who first dared to look on nature with the clear eyes of the mind. <clears throat> After you read this, you realize that Oster was a great believer in the centrality of Greek medicine really moving things along. And of course he turns to Aesculapius, the emblematic god of healing and the son of Apollo. And let me just read to you what he says, <clears throat> no god made with hands had a more successful run than Aesculapius for more than a thousand years of the consoler and healer of the sons of men. Shorn of his divine attributes, he remains our patron saint, emblematic god of healing, whose figure with the serpents appears in our seals and charters. He was originally a Thessalian chieftain and fought in the Trojan War, and his sons Machian and Polarius became famous physicians. Nestor, you may remember, carried off the former, declaring in the oft-quoted phrase that a doctor was better worth saving than many warriors unskilled in the treatment of wounds. Now here is a uh, picture of Aesculapius with his daughter Hygieia with the sacred snake. <clears throat> The idea of the serpent as an emblem of the healing art goes back a long way. Uh, there was natural dread in all of serpents. They were associated with mystic and uh, magical powers. In Greece, they became the symbol of Apollo. Prophetic serpents were kept and fed at the shrine of Aesculapius, and that, in fact, uh, they were felt to <clears throat> be used to predict the future of uh, what happened to, them, to individuals. There's some confusion about the staff of uh, Aesculapius with the single serpent versus what's come down to be known as the caduceus, which is two snakes intertwined. <clears throat> and it's, there's a lot of articles written, and Oster doesn't talk about it. But in actual fact, the caduceus has come to be associated with the emblematic of a, the, the physicians or the medical profession, when in actual fact, it had a different connotation going back to mercantilism uh, and Hermes and Mercury. <clears throat> so in actual fact, the, uh, <coughs> the staff of Apollo, the single snake around the staff is probably the better representation of what we meant about the healing art. <coughs> the temples and cults of Aesculapius did certain things. They were interested in incubation, sleep, or dreams. 
there, some operations were performed there. They believed in miracles. <coughs> and they also believed in diet, exercise, and massage and bathing. These temples or cults were probably more like spas. You went there, uh, you were pampered, you went, and there were stadiums and theaters. Uh, it was really more like a, a health club. And the key person in Greek medicine turned out to be Hippocrates, <coughs> who was a native of Kos and was born around 460 BC. He belonged to the Escalapiad family of distinction, and he had many writings uh, before he died in 375 BC. One of his famous sayings was, where there is love of humanity, there will be love of the profession. The earliest known manuscript of Hippocrates goes back to the ninth century in which he describes human beings composed of four substances or humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. He had a great belief in the power of nature, believed in the art of careful observation. There have been several biographies written about him, and many of the writings have been translated. There's an ongoing debate as to whether all the writings can be attributed to one individual called Hippocrates, or it was a school of individuals who he helped train that really put all the writings together. Here are some of the aphorisms of Hippocrates. The picture on uh, the left is the tree on Kos where supposedly he did his training and teaching to his medical students. Life is short and art is long, the occasion fleeting, experience fallacious and judgment difficult. There are in effect two things to know and to believe one knows. To know is science. To believe one knows is ignorance. And then there's the Hippocratic Oath. And I know we're going to have a whole lecture by Dr. Cole on oaths and the Hippocratic Oath. But I just wanted to re-put this in here and read it very quickly. I swear by Apollo, the physician in Aesculapius, and health and all health, heal, and all the gods and goddesses that according to my ability and judgment I will keep this oath and this stipulation, to reckon him who taught me this art equally dear to me as my parents, to share my substance with him, and relieve his necessities if required, to look upon his offspring in the same footing as my own brothers, and to teach them this art if they shall wish to learn it without fee or stipulation, and that by precept, lecture, and every other mode of instruction, I will impart a knowledge of the art to my own sons, and those of my teachers, and to disciplines bound by a stipulation and oath according to the law of medicine, but to none others. I will follow that system of regimen which, according to my ability and judgment, I will consider for the benefit of my patients and abstain from whatever is deleterious and mischievous. I will give no deadly medicine to anyone if asked, nor suggest any such counsel. And in like manner, I will not give to a woman a pessary to produce abortion. With purity and with holiness, I will pass my life and practice my art. I will not cut persons laboring under the stone, but will leave this to be done by men who are practitioners of this work. Into whatever houses I enter, I will go into them for the benefit of the sick, and will abstain from every voluntary act of mischief and corruption, and further from the seduction of females or males, of free men and slaves. Whatever in connection with my professional service or not in connection with it, I will see or hear in the life of men which are not to be spoken of abroad, I will not divulge, as reckoning that all such should be kept secret. While I continue to keep this oath unviolated, may it be granted to me to enjoy life and the practice of the art, respect by all men in all times. But should I trespass and violate the oath, may the reverse be my lot. Again, I'm sure this will be discussed in great detail in a future lecture, but this comes down through the ages is one of the important oaths that either Hippocrates himself or a group of individuals put together. Around the same time and a little bit later, there was the Alexandrian school, which Ptolemy, who was a general, controlled Alexandria. And this is important because it was the first great medical school of antiquity and had a huge museum where a lot of the information was housed in scrolls and books uh, there, which were actually lost in a, a fire over time. So if we look at a period of about two to 3,000 years, you can see in 3,000 years we've come down to the first medical schools and libraries in Alexandria being founded, 
We've talked about the birth of uh, Escalapius, but there's a lot that preceded this, going back uh, millennia, to both Egypt, China, and even cave paintings in other parts of the world. Now, one of the key figures in medicine it turns out to be Galen, who was born in Pergamon around 130 AD. And this is actually in Asia Minor and corresponds to parts of Turkey today. He died in around 70 years of age and was a disciple of Hippocrates. His main claim is that he dissected animals and used those dissections to sort of put together the anatomy that he thought was in, in, in going on in other animals. But he reckoned that it, what he found in animals would also be true in man, and that wasn't always the case. He carried out many experiments, but for 1,500 years, his, what his writings were were dominant in medical thought, both locally and throughout uh, Europe and North Africa. To give you an idea where this fits in, this is the schema illustrating the Galanic doctrine of the nature of the vascular system. At that time, they did not think that there was a circulation of blood around. And this is what he thought happened, that blood was formed in the litter, liver from food transported to it. It moved from the hepatic vein to the vena cava to the heart by suction of the heart during diastole. And that the rest of the blood was sent by venous system to other organs. And to have this all work, he had an interventricular system between the right and the left heart must be permeable to blood. That's what he thought was the key, that there was this, didn't see it, he just thought there must be these pores. And this view of how the blood worked was kept intact in for over a thousand years. Now let me go and, and say, who did Osler leave out? Here's one that I think he leaves out. Dioscorides, uh, he mentions in the book, but doesn't really describe the importance of Dioscorides. Dioscorides lived around the same time as Galen. He served as a physician and surgeon to the Roman legions. Every time he went around with all these legions, he collected plants from all parts of the world. And he wrote the first, really, uh, pharmacopoeia that's come down called De Matera Matica. And its chapters, names, habitats, botanical descriptions, medicinal usage, harmful side effects of all the plants were described. Unlike other things, he described a plant and tells all the diseases it would cure. And this was authoritative until the 17th century, and it's come down to be thought of as the father of pharmacy. So now we come to the Middle Ages, and Oster gives three reasons for what happened to the Middle Ages. Why did we, why did we have this down period in terms of development? First, he said the barbarians shattered the Roman Empire to its foundations. And at the same time, there was a rise in Christianity, and that the key points in Christianity were really trying to look at the death, judgment, heaven, hell. These were all important concepts. And so science was disregarded as being necessary. It just wasn't necessary. And also at the same time in the 6th century, plague desolated the whole Roman world. So all these, these things coming together led to what we now think of as the Middle Ages. But there was medieval medicine going on at the same time, and there are three things that he discusses. One is what's called the Southern Italian School at Salernum, which is about 35 miles south of Naples, which became one of the first what we consider great medical schools, uh, Byzantine medicine and Arabian medicine, all occurring during medieval medicine times. Razis, who was a Persian physician influenced by Hippocrates and Galen, was a 9th century physician who gave the first accurate account of smallpox and measles, separating the two. He wrote a popular textbook on chemistry from the medical standpoint and introduced mercurial ointments. He's sometimes called the Arabian Hippocrates and wrote an encyclopedia of medicine and surgery. Another key individual at this time among Arabian medicine, also in the 10th century, was Avicenna who was author of the most famous textbook of medicine ever written called The Canon. He died at age 58 and was the prototype of what we thought, what they thought was the successful physician. Statesman, teacher, philosopher, and literary man. He became extremely important over the next decades. So in this case, who did Osler leave out? He leaves out what I think is an important individual, Ibn al-Nafis. And even al-Nafis, who lived around the same time, or maybe a uh, hundred years later, was born in Damascus, and he is attributed to describe the pulmonary circulation. He took the view that he 
thought that the blood ran from the right side of the heart into the lungs, picked up the pneuma or vital force, came back to the left side of the heart, and that was distributed. He dis there's a question as to whether he performed human dissections or not to determine this, because in fact, in his world, human dissections were not thought of as something that was condoned. But he saw enough disease and wounds and so forth that some people think he picked it up just from what he observed from living individuals. Around 1300, you start seeing the rise of universities. A university is literally means an association, and they really grew up around the guilds. And then they slowly became others as we think of it today. Their importance of the universities is they did most of the translations of the Greek works that eventually went to the Syriac, Arabic, Hebrew, back to the Arabic, to the Latin. Over that hundred years, that's what was taking place in many of the universities. And so when you see all these translations, you can imagine what kind of mistakes may have been made going from one language to the next. There are three centers in terms of where the rise of the universities occurred. One is Paris, one is Bologna, and one is Montpellier. And they had their own individuals who were very important, especially as they were related to understanding uh, anatomy and anatomical changes. Here again, one of the people that Osler leaves out and doesn't discuss who I think is an important individual around this time is Ambrose Paré. Ambrose Paré whoops, was an army surgeon, made many contributions, uh, and he decided that we were, they were doing the wrong things by how they were controlling hemorrhage by wound dressings, uh, and he also figured out ways of doing sealing bleeding of arteries by ligature, which was not the case up until that time. A major force in translating new techniques in surgery at the time. Medieval practice was based on the Greek doctrine of the four humors. Here's where bleeding, bleeding was one of the common things that was done and continued for centuries as a way of treating almost anything. Min, uh, mineral medicine was also used Minor surgery was performed by the barbers, and they also believed in astrology and divination, meaning that, in fact, you could look to the stars to predict your future uh, and what was going to happen to you in terms of outcome. And that goes back, again, a thousand years or more. If you were to look at the curriculum of any university at the time, it would be the quadrivium, which was what you studied was astrology, astronomy, music, arithmetic, and geometry. Astrology and astronomy were not separated. Even though the church was opposed to astrology, they had all these prognostications. You could buy these books to tell you what was going to happen by looking at your stars and the pattern of the stars. So the Middle Ages, from the time of Dioscorides and Galen all the way to the medieval text, we see some of these medical schools being found in Europe. The development of professional medical organizations are set up and medical texts are preserved. Let me just read to you what Osler says about the Middle Ages then. To sum up, in medicine, the Middle Ages represent a restatement from century to century of the facts and theories of the Greeks, modified here and there by Arabian practice. There was, in Francis Bacon's phrase, much iteration, small addition. The schools bowed in humble, slavish submission to Galen and Hippocrates, taking everything from them but their spirit, and there was no advance in our knowledge of the structure or function of the body. The Arabians lit a brilliant torch from Grecian lamps, and from the 8th to the 11th centuries, the profession reached among them a position of dignity and importance to which it is hard to find a parallel in history. Then in the next chapter, he turns to the beginning of the Renaissance and the rise of an anatomy and physiology. These are the 16th and 17th centuries. During this time, authority was being shattered not only in medicine, but in other things throughout the world. But they laid down the foundation of an accurate knowledge of the human body and demonstrated how its functions should be studied intelligently. There are three individuals he talks about that uh, he thinks are important to our understanding. One is a man by the name of Paracelsus, who was born in 1493 to a physician father. He died in 1541 and came to be known as the Luther of medicine. 
Avancina wrote the canon of medicine, which was important, and he burned it. He thought we shouldn't go following that. We should try and look at all new information uh, anew. He studied uh, chemistry and pharmacy uh, and believed that everybody should follow his doctrine. I always liked his name was really Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, which I think summarizes the whole idea of his personality. Uh, he had great belief in mystical ideas and practices. He was uh, thought that alchemy was important. It turned out he wrote a couple of interesting things. One, an excellent treatise on syphilis. He thought there were what was come down to be known as vitamins. He was the first to write about illness and, and sickness among minors, uh, but did not believe in anatomy as an answer to medical problems. A very controversial person in the history of medicine. If you go back and read what Osler says or other people, depending on what century you're in, you either write him as a charlatan or as a genius. Uh, he sort of he vacillates in people's opinion as to how good he really was and how important he really should be considered. Now we come to an extremely important individual, Andreas Vesalius, who was born in 1513, died at the age of 50. He was elected chair of anatomy at Padua at the age of 24. Padua was one of the leading medical schools, if not the leading medical school in Europe at the time. Padua was a central facility into the growth of medicine over the next few hundred years. They ended up training key individuals who changed medicine forever. If you go to Padua, you can go to the medical school, you can go to the amphitheater where Vesalius did his dissections, and it's worth seeing uh, just the way it was before, how they had to bring the bodies up from below, separate passageways, how they had people sitting in these rose seats so they could all observe the dissections that were being done. And Andre Vesalius, at the age of 24, was elected chair of anatomy at Padua, and 20 years later wrote the important De Humani Corpus Fabrica. He enlarged and corrected the work of Galen. That's what basically changed it. He did not believe that Galen had it right, and based on his dissections of individuals, he showed the way. Uh, this is the template from what Andre Vesalius' uh, book that was eventually written which became a, a landmark in the history of medicine. Let me just read again what uh, Osler says of the book. A year or more was spent at Basel with his friend, supervising the printing of the great work, which appeared in 1543 with the title De Humani Corporis Fabrica. The worth of a book as of a man must be judged by results. And so judged the Fabrica is one of the great books of the world and would come in any century of volumes which embrace the richest harvest of the human mind. In medicine, it represents the full flower of the Renaissance. As a book, it is a sumptuous tome. What happened to Vesalius is also worth uh, recounting. Uh, and here again, I quote from Osler. There is no such pathetic tragedy in the history of our profession. Before the age of 30, Vesalius had effected a revolution in anatomy. He became the valued physician of the great court of Europe, but call no man happy till he is dead. A mystery surrounds his last days. The story is that he had obtained permission to perform a post-mortem examination on the body of a young Spanish nobleman whom he had attended. When the body was opened, the spectators, to their horror, saw the heart beating, and there were signs of life. Accused, so it is said, by the inquisition of murder and also of general impropriety, he only escaped through the intervention of the king with the condition that he make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. In carrying this out in 1564, he was wrecked on the island of Zante, where he died of a fever or exhaustion in the 50th year of his life. So uh, now we come to the history of the theory of circulation. We've talked a little bit about what Galen thought. We've told you a little about Ibn al-Nafis. We now know Vesalius wasn't much further along in his understanding of the circulation of the blood as Galen. Some of these other individuals like Servetus and Columbo and Fabricius 
really made uh, some contributions as it related to the pulmonary circulation and picking up the idea of va valves in the venous system. But it was left to William Harvey to put together the new theory, which turned out to be correct, on how the blood circulated throughout the body. William Harvey wrote his important book, De Morto Cortis, in 1628, made the point that the heart contracts and that there was circulation of blood from artery to veins. He did a lot of his own experiments uh, in different ways of trying to prove the point by observation and uh, physical examination of individuals as well as just calculating exactly how much blood would flow. And so he really found certain things that turned out to be true. He said there were no intraventricular pores. The heart is the driving pump and the movement of the blood is due to the systolic pushing, not diastolic sucking the blood forward. Arterial flow is away from the heart. Venous flow is towards the heart. Venous valves are there to facilitate one-way flow towards the heart. There is a pulmonary circuit and the continuous consumption of blood at the tissues and its replacement by, replacement by de novo production of blood by the liver is not possible once you take into cardiac output and the heart rate are considered. And so he put all of this together, published it, and it became an important, exceedingly important document that changed the nature of how we looked at both anatomy and physiology and, and uh, human individuals disease processes. So the three great individuals that Oster talks about in the Renaissance are Paracelsus, Andre Vesalius, and Harvey. And they become excruciatingly important for the next phase of what happens to medicine. So we've gone through and quickly reviewed early antiquity, Greece and Rome, got to the Renaissance. And we've, that's about 3,000 years worth of history in uh, a short period of time. Next time in part two, we're going to do chapters five and six, which is basically the last 300 years. So we're doing 3,000 years of history in one hour and 300 uh, years of history in one hour. And in addition, next week, we will talk about what would Osler consider the top 10 developments of the past 100 years after his death if he were alive. Thank you.